insights into the weekly parsha on this beautiful Thursday morning. Today, the seventh day of Hanukkah. I hope everybody is enjoying the beautiful illumination of this beautiful festival. I appreciate everybody joining me here in the Boca Jewish Center Zoom Room, our learning center. And for those of you who are joining us via social media, this week's parsha is Parsha's Miketz. Now, oftentimes, Parsha's Miketz is also Shabbos Hanukkah, not the case this year. For those of you who would like to follow along in our learning this morning, can do so. The uh, Parshas Miketz is found in the article Stone Blue Chumash on page 222 in the Hebrew, page 223 in the English. Let's get started. We know that there is so much to be said for when a person is heading on the pathway and the roadway of life. A person is looking forward, a person is looking ahead, but it's also significant for a person to look in the rearview mirror to remember where it is that a person comes from, where it is that we are originated from the stories that we are meant to promulgate, the stories that we are meant to continue to write, the narratives and the chapters of the chronicles of our lives, telling the stories as they continue to unfold. And we are able to do this most successfully when we are mindful of and we continue to think about where it is that we come from. And we note that the place that we come from is a place of holiness, a place of source of blessing. This is a significant theme, a significant idea. When we learn our Parsha this morning, Parsha's Miketz, the Torah and Parsha's Miketz, of course, tells us of the birth of Yosef Hatzadik's two sons in Mitzrayim. As everything is unfolding, of course, now he's in Egypt. He has this prominent position. He becomes the second in command. <clears throat> and, of course, he sets about to collect the abundance of food in preparation for the seven devastating years of famine, as he predicted the dreams of Paro, the years that lay ahead. But again, there's this pause in this intermediate period of time from when there's this prediction, from when there's this now appointment, and now there's going to be the collection anticipating the years of famine that are going to devastate not just Egypt, not just the region, but are going to devastate in a very cataclysmic, extraordinary way, going to devastate the entire world. The Torah tells us, though, that there's two sons that are born to Yosef. Well, Yosef, you let shnei bonim beterem tovo shnas arav. Joseph had two sons that are born before the year of the famine set in. And this um, union that, that was had in the marriage of Asnas, the daughter of Potifera, the, da- the governor of On, this was his wife. These are the sons that he has. Now, it's not just that we're told that he has two sons. There is now an explanation. Now, you have, obviously, when you have a simcha, a father, a mother, they'll share the, the reason for why a child is given a particular name for a boy, for a girl, and this, here we have in Chumash, no different. Not only are we told that these are the sons that he has, Ephraim, Menashe and Ephraim, first of all this is Menashe, and then Ephraim, but the Torah tells us what's the reason why, the etymology of their name, <clears throat> the reason for the name. Why were these names specifically cho- chosen? So the Pesach tells us, Vayikra Yosef Eshashem HaBechor Menashe, the first born, he names, as we know, Menashe, because Menashe, the root of the way it's explained, is an expression of God has caused me to forget all of my toil and all of my father's house. Abundance of, of literature and commentary, the Mepharshim explaining what in the world is that supposed to mean? That he's meant to forget? He was so connected, so intrinsically united with his father and his bias, his house, his history, his lit his lineage. Why is it that that was the name that was given to his firstborn, Menashe? A lot of different explanations. Today we're going to focus on the second name, the second name that's given to his second son, Ve'ez Shem HaSheni Kar Ephraim. Now what's Ephraim? Ephraim, the name of his second son. Now Ephraim, Ki Ephroni, from the word Ephroni, Ephraim, Ephroni Lukim Be'eretz on Ye, because Hashem has made me fruitful. I'm able to have children. I'm able to promulgate, to uh, you know, to grow my family in the land of my affliction, meaning that he realizes that this isn't his homeland. This isn't where he's destined to be, but this is the land of his affliction, what he's been afflicted with until now, where he finds himself in the current predicament that he's in, and where he realizes that he ultimately has to have the mindset of what Mitzrayim means to the Jewish people in the future, knowing full well, probably, what's going to be, lie in store, what's going to be. So here we see that the name Menashe has its root, the second name of Ephraim has its root. Ephroni is a Hephroni Elohim Be'eretz on Yi. God has made me fruitful. I have become abundant in this sense, not just in the sense of my, my prosper and my prominence, but also because of my ability to be fruitful and to multiply in the land of my affliction. Now, this is very significant. When we think about just names, 
we think about the symbolism, we think about what they mean, and we think about their permanence in our lives. All of us have names that have meaning. We are named after people. We have names that perhaps have some biblical meaning, some connotation. Maybe it's a Hebrew name, a Hebrew word rather. So here you have what is significant in the mohus, the essence of a person and what it means to you or what it means to the person who's giving the name. We know that when you give your child a name, if you're naming after somebody, it has a lot of great meaning to you. You're naming it after a bubby, a zadi, a grandmother, a grandfather, a cousin, a relative, a, a family member that's very, very close to you. So when you give that child that name, it means so much to you. You want it to mean so much to that child because, of course, of who that person meant to you. So here we have that this name that's given to Ephraim, that this name that's given to Manasseh, these names are representative of what it is emotionally that Yosef HaTzadik is feeling. A, some level of forgetfulness as it relates to the toil of his father's house, maybe because of his yearning to connect, connect to them, the manifestation of the dreams that had to play themselves out. So, but how difficult that must have been for him not to connect, to reconnect to his family. Suffice it to say, this is manifest in the constant reminder of every time he's going to say the name Menashe, it's the chizuk, it's the necessary reminder of inspiration that he needs to have to stay the course. And the second, of course, is how thankful he was to be fruitful in the land of his affliction. But here's where I want to share a nuanced approach, something that is significant. When we think about remembering where it is that we come from and the consequences that come from that and the lives that we live differently because of that, and what is the eternal reward for that? So the Dazen came to me, Baliatosis, and they explain something that's very different. Now, we have the Torah explanation of what the name, let's focus on Ephraim is, and now we have the Dazen came to me, Baliatosis, who explained that the name Ephraim has another connotation, has a second meaning. Now, this word, Ephraim, the Tosis explained, can be read as, Eph, what's, what's Afer? Ephraim, Afer is dust. It's, it's ashes. So Afer in the singular. Ephraim is multiple ashes, multiple dusts. So that means the Tosas explain that the word is meant to be read double ashes. What's double ashes? So the reference they explain is to Yosef's great-grandfather and great-grandfather, right? His grandfather and his great-grandfather. Who's that? Avram and Yitzchak. So Yitzchak, of course, was his grandfather. Great-grandfather is Avram, so what does that have to do with his grandfather and his great-grandfather? Now, the Dazakane of Alatosis explains that both of these personalities who are embedded in who he is are both associated in some way with ashes, with some type of this form of afer. Now, we know, for example, we know that Avram Avinu, in his plea to the Ribbona Shalom, when he was begging Almighty God to spare the city of Sodom, what did he say? Anoichi offer ve'efer. I am, but earth and ash. That is how he described himself. That's Avram Avinu. What about Yitzchak? So Yitzchak, in a number of different explanations, Chazal tell us that the Rebbe Shalom considers Yitzchak's ashes collected on the mizbeach after he was nearly shechted, as he was nearly slaughtered as a sacrifice. So we see that there was ashes that were collected that are symbolic of the sacrifice that Yitzchak Avinu, his grandfather, was willing to allow himself to be sacrificed insofar if that was the Ratzon Hashem, if that was divine providence, divine command, if that's the will of God, so that's what it has to be. So you have two associations, a Noichi Ofer Ve'efer Avram Avinu, and you have the ashes, the Ofer representing Yitzchak and the Akedas Yitzchak, and the whole episode where he was almost nearly sacrificed, slaughtered, in this divine service as his father Avram Avinu was commanded to do. So in naming his son Ephraim, right, Afer, Ephraim, the Tosas and right, Tosas is right, the Bali Tosas is right, that Yosef was recalling his illustrious forebearers, both of whom are associated with ashes. So now it's very interesting to think about what that means. So it's not just to simply my emotional connection to it, the fact that my connection to my family, my parents, my father specifically, and secondly, to think about the fact that in my land of affliction, I have prosper and I have abundance and I have children. The question, of course, is why then would the Bali Tosasin draw this connection between Yosef and Sadiq, Yosef's situation in Mitzrayim, and Avram Avinu, and Yitzchak, why is this association with ashes? You know, again, when you are naming a child, when you are associating something, you want a mida, you want a fine attribute, you want something that's going to define them, something that's going to cajole them to live their lives in a certain way. Here, 
Ephraim, or in this case, Ephar, Ephraim, this is not just to think about you, that you are, think about when he gets a little bit older, you were born in this place of my affliction. You have to know there's something about your name that's double ashes, that is symbolic of your great-grandfather and your great-great-grandfather, meaning Yitzchak and Avram Avinu. And there you have the ashes that are associated. So what does that mean? So there's a beautiful... Um, explanation that was penned by Rabbi Aaron Leib Steinman Zatzal in his writings, Ayelet HaShachar. We wrote something so beautiful where he suggests the following idea, that there's a very powerful connection that relates to Yosef's newfound position of authority, of his prestige, of his honor, of now he's second in command in Mitzrayim in Egypt. So you know what happens when a person gets put into and catapulted to a place of prominence, to a place of success, a place of, of, of real consequence, where now you are with the signet ring that was placed upon his finger. Now he was given all the power that was necessary for him to be able to not only rule, but to be able to govern. Now he leaves the palace. He was now incarcerated for so much time. He was thrown, thrown into the proverbial pit of his brothers. And now he has this extraordinary change in status. He is all but 30 years old. He's had a rough go at it for quite some time over the most recent years. And now he's able to go out and be this person. So Rabbi um, Aryan Leib Steinman says, and I yell to something unbelievable, that really what the Balitosis are explaining, they're teaching that Yosef overcomes a moral challenge of power. There's a certain challenge that comes with being in power. Like the Mishnah Perkyova says, you should be sna, you should be snasa rabonis. What snasa rabonis means you should you should have a revolt against it. something should be vile of the power, the rabonis. The rabonis represents a certain sense of power or any act of power, any position of government authority, any dominance that a person has over somebody. There's a certain moral challenge that a person has. Why? Because when you have power, you have a shliti, you have a role, rule over other people. So what happens, there's like Sometimes that that level of power compromises a, a better moral judgment. There's a certain sense of piety. There's a certain sense of integrity. There's a certain sense of sensitivity that Yosef at Tzaddik teaches that hold that we're that we're taught holds on to that he lives with that he maintains. Why? Because and very singularly because he follows the examples that are represented by these two references of the ashes of, of Avram Avinu of, of Yitzchak. His grandfather, his great grandfather. Why? How do we know? Avram Avinu, we have to remember, was an extraordinary example. Was a man of extraordinary achievement. He was a man of extraordinary stature. He was a man that found the rebbonishon, but we sometimes overlook the fact that he had tremendous, tremendous stature. But nonetheless, despite the fact that he was this extraordinary person with an unbelievable stature, he's the father of all nations. He's the man of God who walks with God in a singular sense. He's one who finds the Rebbe and he has this tent that is not only all welcoming, but is all inviting under the monotheistic teaching for which he is now sharing this with the world. He lives with a sense, nonetheless, with a neichi of a veefer. Rabbi Steinman says that this is the first lesson that we understand. Yosef at Tzaddik, the Balitoser, are telling us that, that Yosef at Tzaddik, in naming his son Ephraim, is reminding himself and then his child and understanding the, 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 underst the understood piety, the integrity, the sensitivity that he was able to maintain, the moral vigor that he was able to hold on to, that in relation to the Rebbe Shalom, just like Avram Avinu, who in relation to the Rebbe Shalom is Anechi Ofer Ve'efer, all human beings are essentially earth and ash. Being a balgaiva, being a haughty, high-headed person, thinking that your achievements are because of your hands, or because of your doings, or because of anything that you have done. Yes, we do hishtadlis, and we make efforts, and we do everything that we can, but our success and our failures are only due, really, to what the Ratzon Hashem is, the opportunities that we have before us. If we're going to go through those doors as they're open, we're going to close them. We're not going to utilize opportunities as they stand before us. All human beings are essentially afar ve'efar, all essentially earth and ash. Yosef Hatzadik never allows his position of power, his prominence, his success to lead to pride, to arrogance, this gaiva, right? And he remains ultimately a sense for which he's with a, an anivus. He's keenly and humbly aware of his, of his limitations. 
He has a low stature in relation to, to the Almighty. You know, when you are Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Samid, when you are Dalifne Miata Omid, when you're constantly vigilantly reminding yourself, which is why this is certain senses that that sit atop the Aaron Kodesh, a blaze in a person's eyes and a person's heart, remind us that as haughty as sometimes and as arrogant as sometimes we live our lives, we are to be humbly aware of the fact that every man, every person, every human being has limitations. rabos We were all built, born and built with limitations. You think you can do everything, you can't do everything. You feel that you are limited and you're, that you're limitless in your ability to achieve and to accomplish, you're limited. You ever feel overcome by, by sleep? Just sleep alone is very humbling. The Bali Musa explained that just the idea that you want to continue to move, to, to energize and to create, to be active, is limited by just even sleep. You just simply cannot open your eyes any longer. A whole host of just, a litany of just limitations, of course, that we all know. A lowly stature in relation to the Rebbe Hashem, there's a certain sense of Neuchi off of Ephraim, as Avraham Avinu, he himself has this stature, but he himself is always mindful of who he is and what he's comprised of and what his limitations are and how much gratitude, how much thanks how much righteousness he's able to maintain insofar as it remembers who he is in relation to the Rebbe That's the first thing. The second thing is that Yosef at Sadiq, he follows the example of Yitzchak. Now, what is Yitzchak? Who is Yitzchak? He has a sense of gevura, a sense of mincha in the middle of the day, and a sense of his basoda, the suach basoda, he is engaging in the middle of the day. He has a gevura, as a strength. He is, though, of course, as we know, the Torah, the biblical model of a boundless self-sacrifice and devotion. He's bound on the Mizbeach. He's bound on the altar as a sacrifice. Now, what is this symbolic of? This symbolism is a dimion of complete, of unbridled commitment. There is nothing that is in my way. There is nothing that will deter my efforts that if it is the Ratzon Hashem, if it's the will of God, that even if it means he has to give up his life, he has to allow himself to be bound. Again, Yitzhak was not a little baby. We are taught that he was 37 years old. He allows himself. He is understanding of his father's tafkid in teaching Hashem Echad, and he allows himself to likewise live with that same commitment. If this is the will of God, this is the Ratzon of Yitzhak. This is the will of my, my ways. And so therefore, likewise, not letting his own status get to his head, what Yosef understood that his role as a manhig and that his role as a leader was to be used not for selfish interests, right? It wasn't meant for him to, to, to suggest that his best you know, suggestions for his own best interests are now going to be manifest, but for the benefit of others. You know, today in politics and government and leadership, we don't see that. We see lots of people, scandal after scandal, event after event, where people's self-interest now become the cover story, the front page news, because I can interpret what leadership is to me and is that I'm going to get ahead. I'm going to dominate. I'm going to rule. My self-interests are first and foremost. But that's not, even though what's very enticing and intoxicating about what leadership could mean for some, what it's not meant is for a person to understand anything other than the purpose of leadership is to lead the people, is to be an emissary of the Rebbeinu to understand that the reason why you were put in this position to begin with is to bring about this national story. Certainly in the case of Yosef and true about any situation. If you were put in a situation, that means the Rebbeinu Shalom put you in that situation. And being in that situation demands a sense of selflessness a sense of community, a camaraderie with others, and an understanding of a global look and see as to what the reason is. This is what Yosef understood. And the reason why Yosef was able to understand this is because he remembered a little bit of history. He remembered where he comes from. He realizes that being a leader is not about now promulgating self-interest. And by the way, that could very well parenthetically be part and parcel as to why he doesn't reunite yet with his father, with his siblings, with his family. Why? because that was not his tough kid. Even though when he first leaves the palace and he goes out to check out the cities and the, the abundance and the storehouses and the silos, those very moments he could have taken his chariot and he could have just directed it towards the land of Canaan to Eretz Yisrael. And he said, Tati, Abba, Daddy, I'm back. It's me, I'm Yosef. I see that you're high. No, 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 he doesn't do that. Why? Because it wasn't about selfish, selfish interests. In fact, maybe the fact that he's able to contain himself and name his son Menashe to remind himself that the toil that he would otherwise wish that he would engage, insofar that he would go back to visit his father, to reunite with his father, he had to put that 
off to the side as painful as that was. We sometimes tend to think that Yosef was cold and callous. He was unwilling to reunite until this whole, uh, you know, the dream episode is, is manifest. But the truth of the matter is that those dreams were divine. And since those dreams were divine, they had to be, they had to be fulfilled. So maybe it wasn't that he was cold and callous, chas v'shalom. It means that he had a determined interest that he had to now make sure was intact. The benefit of others. He was now in this leadership position. And indeed, he utilizes the position that he's put in, in Mitzrayim, to save the entire region, the entire world from starvation. He oversees the storage of grain during the surplus, the seven years of abundance, its distribution during the subsequent years of drought and famine. So this is the significance of the Tosis' reference in the context of Avram, in the context of Yitzchak, in the perspective of his association, of course, with the ashes. Understanding that there's a root in your name. There's a root in who I am. It's going to be that every single time I call the name Menashe, but more specifically the name Ephraim, Ephraim is a farim that every time I'm going to say your name, come to the dinner table, Ephraim. Come, please, let's go to the learning base measures together. Every time I'm going to say that name, I'm going to be mindful of what that name means to me, what it means about me, and what it means for you, as you are to understand sacrifice, uncompromise, and understanding what it means that to know that you're offer of afer, that no matter what your situation is, with humility, with a sense of hubris, a sense of anivus, does a person serve the Rebbe Hashem no matter what, no matter when, no matter how. So what the Tosas is secure to understand and help us appreciate is that Yosef at Tzadik's piety was even as he ruled over the largest empire on earth, right? His righteousness, Yosef at Tzadik, his character to his humility and to his selflessness, his awareness that even in the most accomplished man, right, is as is, is lowly as ashes. Now, that doesn't mean you don't see yourself as prominent. That doesn't mean that Yosef didn't see himself as prominent. But what we see in the Yosef at Tzadik story, time and time again, over and over, whether it's while he's in the pit, while he's traveling down to Mitzrayim, while he's in the dungeon, while he's interpreting the dream uh, you know, of the Chamberlains, whether it's then interpreting the dream in front of Paro, when he's standing before Paro and Paro says, I understand that you are an interpreter of dreams. He says, it's me that's interpreting dreams. It's the Rebona Shalom, it's the Almighty that interprets dreams. Like how many people, under the pressure of the circumstance. How many people would buckle? How many people would, uh, would gawk at the opportunity? Now, oh, power, yeah, 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 I can interpret dreams, knowing that if he's successful in interpreting the dreams, this is his get out of jail ticket. This is his ability to now change the story, flip the coin on its head. Now he's able to do that. No, no, no. What does he say? Dreams aren't for me. I'm not the interpreter of dreams. The Almighty is the interpreter of dreams. I'm just the doorman, if you will. I'm just going to be the conduit to be able to express what the Ratzon Hashem is, what the will of God is, and the fact that it's talking about seven years of abundance that are going to be followed by seven years of famine. And you must prepare, because if not, your land, the people, humanity will be decimated. And the fact that the dream happens twice is because of God's impending plan to do it now imminently. You are being told this, Paro, I'm just simply communicating what the, what the will of God is. So we understand there's a certain sense of piety. It's a sense of anivos, despite the fact that he has this extraordinary success. He's catapulted this position of, of a high level of authority, this highest ranking person besides Paro himself. <clears throat> Only my throne shall outrank you. Nothing else will I concern myself in the saving of our society. You are that person where there's a Ruach Elohim, there's a, a spirit of godliness. Is that not how Paro describes Joseph to his, uh, to his advisors? He says, who is this man? After it is that Joseph says to him, a discerning man, a person who's going to be quick, who's going to be strategic, a person who's going to be, you know, discerning in the sense of how he's going to prepare the land for what's going to devastate them. And if they're not prepared, they're going to be lost. Who is a better man, says Pyro, to his chartumim, to his necromancers, to his Scanim to his assistants says, who is a better man than a man who is a godly man, where there's a godly spirit who evokes the name of God, who evokes the name of God in such a situation? He's thrown into this pit. Any other person, this is the reason why he's called a tzaddik, because any other person would not live with that sense of righteousness easily. Another person would think that my family has cast me a, 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 a yonder. My father maybe sent me out to the field. I was met by my brothers who want to kill me. 
They have been vile and 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 in castigating each other, which is why I brought evil reports according to one interpretation. I've been thrust into this pit. I'm with snakes and scorpions. I'm with this this vile of the world. I've been sold, and I've been now transported, and I'm now in this environment which is extraordinarily different, unique, and awfully. Uh, you know, unfamiliar to me from my childhood, from my upbringing, and now I'm in this place, and now I have a child, and now I have two children. How do I name my child? My children, Ephraim, is these ashes inside this name, says so Steinman. Inside these names, and in this name in particular, is the essence, is the mahus uh, from where he comes from. You have to always remember where you come from. A person who fails to remember where you come from, if you fail to look in the rear view mirror, you'll never be able to know and properly look ahead. That's Rabbi Beryl Wine's famous, you know, little anecdotal concept, the idea that you have to look in the rear view mirror to be able to know how successfully you're able to move forward in life. How you move forward in life is first and foremost, knowing your playing field, but also being keenly aware of where it is that you come from. Those places that you come from, those places inspire us. Those places remind us. Those places not only give your children a sense of who they are, but of course, also, as we call their names, also remind us where we stay focused. Maybe it was that the greatest form of security to maintain the piety from which he was able to hold on to his faith. You know, it's not unfamiliar for some people who struggle, have hard times. They're met with certain financial struggles, some legal struggles, some fin- some shalom bias issues. They're, they're struggling. So sometimes people, they do is they turn to God. They have a certain connection. Where a person has that connection in those situations is not terribly unfamiliar. But when a person has that connection to the Rebbe Shem, when they are with abundance, when they are with tremendous success, then that is truly indicative of a righteousness. Here Yosef is now saved. He's now in a totally different situation. And now that he's in a totally different situation, he yet still has the poise, the piety, the sense, the sensibility to be able to name his son as such that every time I'm going to call your name, that is offer, that is afer of Yitzchak and afer of Avram Avinu, knowing who you are, the humility you have to have and the sacrifice that's necessary no matter what it is, no matter when, no matter how. Now, when you think about this, remember where you come from. I think it's essential to think about what happens because sometimes what I think many people fail to remember is that history is a catalyst for Emuna. It's a catalyst for success, for great redemption, right? It's this history and reflecting on that history that makes Joseph who he is, Yosef at Tzadik, the Tzadik that he is. And then the story as it unfolds towards the end of Sefer Barashas and of course the beginning of Sefer Shemos and the story then of our salvation. Now this is true in so many different writings. We know that the Ramban, for example, and other Rishon and believe the one can develop even their emuna, their faith by studying history. As the Pasuk tells us, binu remember the days of the world, right? Yemos olam, discern the years of every generation. In other words, if a person says the Ramban, if a person ponders and probes history, human history, you're going to see God. You're going to see the Rebona You're going to see the hand of God. And that's what Yosef at Tzaddik is doing. He's saying, I see the hand of God. I know the attributes of my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather from whom I come. This child, you are the link in that chain. You have to also likewise see that. Here's an unbelievable story where you see that sometimes people get lost from that. But what we do is when we study history, it's a catalyst for Emuna. This has an unbelievable ending. The beginning is extraordinary. Listen to this. So there's a fellow, there was a man by the name of Silas Hardun. Silas Hardun, he came from a traditional Jewish family in Iraq. Now he moved to China after you know growing up in Iraq. He moved to China. And after he moved to China, he was assimilated, but, uh, you know, forgot about where he came from, from his roots. He wasn't a practicing Jew, didn't really think too much about the Jewish holidays, certainly didn't think about kosher, didn't think about Tarsim Mishpacha and various other mitzvahs, 613 of them. But while he was there, he achieved an exceptional amount uh, of wealth. He was a very, very successful person. In fact, he became one of the wealthiest men in all of Asia. He, he, was on, he was an industrialist. He was a real estate developer. He was a man of great renown, Mr. Silas Hardun. He was a very well-known person. Now, very tragically, he abandoned his roots completely. It wasn't just that he, you know, like 
didn't have a Pesach Seder. Right? He married one of his tenants, a Chinese Buddhist woman. He built a Buddhist temple and he had a Buddhist nursery on his grounds. This is how vite, how far he went. He was so far that he even had a Buddhist nursery on his grounds. He was childless, he never had children. Now, once he got very old, he resolved that he's gonna give away you know, some of his money. And he decided that he's going to give his you know, fortune predominantly to Chinese charities. Because that's what he knew. That was the life that he lead, you know, that he led, and that's what he was doing. And so that's what he decided. He's going to bequeath his way wealth to the charities that he was more familiar with. Now, one night, Mr. Hardun, he has a dream, goes to sleep, and he has a dream. And this is appropriate because in the parshios where we learn about first Yaakov Inu's dream that the Malachim are Olim Vyardimbo, and then of course Paro's dreams and Yosef's dreams that have to be manifest in this story. This safer Boratius is in many ways a safer of dreams of this, this unbelievable, seemingly inexplicable, but certainly so discernible element of where a dream is had and its resonance in our lives becomes so significant. And so we talk about another dream here. This Mr. Hadouni has a dream and in his dream, his father who had passed away, of course, Aaron was his name. He came to him in a dream. You'll hear sometimes people say that their father, their grandfather, a relative came to them in a dream. <clears throat> so he falls asleep and this night he wakes up. His father came to him in his dream. And when he was encountering his father in his dream, his father said to him, you're endowing different institutions. That's fine. What are you doing for your own people? You must do something for your own people. He wakes up and he's like startled, falls back to sleep. He has the same dream the next night. His father comes back to him again. He demanded that he do something for his own people. On the third night, his father returns. On the fourth night, his father returns. His father was relentless and persistent. He would never, he wouldn't give up. Now, it would be great if this was a story that he has a dream eight nights, connect perfectly with Hanukkah, but it was only apparently four nights. Finally, Mr. Hardun, he realizes that he's getting a message. He realized that his father's coming to him in a dream. He didn't know exactly what to do. The dream was turning into a real nightmare for him. He had no connection to his past. He had no roots that he was connected to. He didn't even really know what that meant to give something to your people. He was literally just so devastated by the nightmare that he would refer to, the nightmares that he had of his father coming to him, not once, not twice, four times in a row, that you have to leave something, not just for the charities that you've chosen, but you have to leave something for your people. So as the story goes, this Mr. Hadun, he went to see a, a chacham. He went to see a makubal. There was a makubal who was in that time who happened to be passing by through Shanghai at the time. And he was able to make an appointment with this, you know, he was a very wealthy man. He was able to make an appointment probably with anybody he wanted to. So he makes an appointment with his rabbi, with his chacham, with his makubal. And he says to him, tells him everything that he heard, that he, that he heard his father tell him, that he experienced. And the Chacham tells him, the Chacham tells him that you have to hear your father's words. You have to listen to everything that your father tells you. You must do something for the Jewish people. There must be something that you can do for them. He said, what should I do? So the rabbi told him, right here in Shanghai, I'll tell you what you should do. I want you to build a magnificent synagogue. Don't just build a, you know, a place for a Buddhist you know, uh, temple, a, a Buddhist nursery, I want you to build a magnificent synagogue, a huge synagogue with a dining hall. I want you to build it with a dormitory. I want you to build a beautiful edifice with a base medrash, the works. He looks at him and says, Rabbi, are you serious? Are you crazy? First of all, it's money in the, in the garbage. But if you're telling me that's what I have to do to honor my father's memory, there's no Jews here. There's just a tiny Jewish community. This again, you have to remember, friends, this was China, 1920. 1920, so there's no Jews here. I'm building this monstrosity, this edifice, base manager, a dormitory, a cafeteria. Like, are you serious? A shul? That's what I should do? The Chacham said to him, you have to do it. You have to do it. So he was very unsettled by these dreams. Night after night, dream after dream. Again, you have to remember, we're talking about a very assimilated Jew who practiced Buddhism. That, that's what we're talking about. And yet, <clears throat> this Chacham, his eyes were piercing. 
His, his message was relentless. He was insistent. He was adamant. He said, you have to do it. These are my instructions to you. This is precisely what you have to do. The Chacham, this Rav was unflinching. And so this Silas Hardun, he finally agrees. He says, I'm going to do it. He got his construction crew together. He, again, he was in real estate. He puts up this magnificent edifice, this huge building, this dining hall, a dormitory, a base medrash. And he names this base medrash, this place, Base Aaron, Beth Aaron. <clears throat> Why? Because he figured it's going to be the Zecha Nishmas, whatever that meant to him. He didn't really know what that meant at the time. It's going to be named after his father. Here he's going to leave something in this place for his people in memory of his father. And that's what he did. And for years, for years, people in the region, they passed the building and they laughed at, at, at the senile, demented rabbi who had instructed the eccentric Hardun to build such a structure for nobody and for nothing. That's what you have to build. That's what you're going to tell me. It was like all these rumors, all this gossip, all this, you know, being disparaging of this rough of this Mr. Hardoon. He's got a lot of money, but snicker, snicker behind the table. This guy's a wacko. This guy's a senile. This guy has no idea, nothing for nobody, no purpose, no reason. And that's how it was. Now, if you think about it again, when we study the miracles that have happened to the Jewish people throughout history, we have a moon, we have faith. We have faith. We have a strength in our belief in the Almighty. Because even though we think that this structure was built for nobody and it was built for nothing, that was true until 1941. Because until 1941, everything changed. Due to the Nazi onslaught, so the yeshivas in, in Eastern Europe were scrambling, of course, for safety. The only yeshiva in the world to escape fully intact, the only one, through the largesse of the consulate of Japan, the consul was Yeshiva Asmir. The Talmidim of the Yeshiva traveling from Siberia, they reached Kobe, Japan. From Kobe, Japan, they ended up in Shanghai, China. That's where they ended up. There were no accommodations for the Mir Yeshiva. You have hundreds, literally hundreds of students who were able to escape the, 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 the inferno of Eastern Europe uh, demise. There was nowhere for them to learn. There was nowhere for where they're from to sleep. There was nowhere for them to eat until somebody says to them, one second, there's a gargantuan empty synagogue named Beth Aaron. There's nobody there. There's a tiny Jewish community. The students in exile, they couldn't believe it. Nisim v'niflaos. Hodos v'halel. Extraordinary, miraculous findings. It had the exact number of seats that matched the student body of the Mir Yeshiva for five years. The Mir Yeshiva Talmidim were ensconced in Beth Aaron in Shanghai, China. They were steiging, they were learning, they were growing in Avodah Hashem. They were ready to take on Israel and America to spread Torah and Yiddishkeit to a barren world. Think about that. Think about how history happens that even though this person where he had this extraordinary disconnect, he's able to have this reconnect, and this reconnect for his and to his roots has then the ability to build this edifice, which is where Shanghai, China, of all places, the mirror yeshiva for five years in escaping the Nazis is where there's home, where there's board, where there's food, where there's a dormitory based medrash, where there's a place for these tell me them to escape and then to be able to then grow from and then to spread Torah and to then rebuild it in an extraordinary way to remember your roots to remember where it is you come from an unbelievable expression from that and that's what's so important for us to remember as the Ramban writes at the end of of, of, of uh, Parshas Mishpatim Amina Nisim HaGidolim Amafarsimim Adamoide Benisim HaNistarim we have to remember that when it comes to the great miracles, the extraordinary events. It's remind us also that there are hidden miracles as well. There's hidden things, not only in the miraculous things that we do, but in the names. 
And here what we understand from the Das Akenami Baleotosis that there is true, yes, there's a name that's given to Ephraim to mean Hifroni Elukim Be'eretz on Yi, that it's meant for me to thank the Almighty for being fruitful in the land of my affliction, but say the Das Akenami Baleotosis, no, it's Ephraim, Ephraim, it means the double ashes, Anoichi Ofer Ve'efer, I am but a collection of just da- dust and ash, and like that was Avram Avinu, so to Yitzchak, the ashes collected from the Mizbeach, from the altar, he was nearly sa- slaughtered as a sacrifice. Here's the connection, says Rabbi Yehuda Leib Steinman, and Ayelah Sashachar, that this is Anoichi Ofer Ve'efer, that he remembered this in his prominence, in his success, he never failed to appreciate who he was, Yosef Tzadik. He names his children in this. And this way, he import, parts with them this idea of being always connected to your roots. Ephraim, know who your great-grandparents are. Know who your grandparents are. Know from where you come. Menashe, remember the house from where it is you originate. And when you remember the place that you come, you know where it is that you originate from. Look what can happen. You reconnect to your roots. This is a holiday a holiday of rededicating ourselves, rededicating not only the kindling of the flame in the Beis HaMikdash, but rededicating what it means to have a Beis HaMikdash, what it means to want and to yearn for the rededicating and the rebuilding of the third Beis HaMikdash. And so, as tonight, we're going to light the eighth and final candle, and we are going to celebrate Vizos Chanukah, the totality of this miraculous eight days celebrating not just the miracle of the cruise of oil, not just the miracle of our military victory over the Syrian Greek army, the Hashmonaim, the, Koh- the Kohan and the priests who were dedicated and steadfast in their efforts to reconsecrate and re- to rededicate themselves to themselves, but for us to remember that we remember when we rekindle that flame, we illuminate the light, not just in our temple, in our homes, but in our hearts. And we do that, we remember and think to ourselves, why do we have a temple? Why do we want a base of Mikdash? Why is it such a celebration to illuminate the menorah? Because make for me a Mikdash and I will dwell besocham. I will dwell among you, among it. I will be within you because I, Ribona Shalom, am intrinsically you. As long as you welcome me to you, you are a Neshama Tahira, you are a holy soul. And all what the means for Shachanti Besocham, what that means is that I will dwell in you because you are holy. Make yourself a Mikdash. Make for me a place in you that you're able to dwell. And when we're able to illuminate ourselves, we're able to illuminate others along the way. Let's remember where we come from. Let's take the lessons of how Yosef at Sadiq, how he names his sons what it means to him, what it means to us, what it means for humanity. And when we take this lesson to heart, we'll appreciate the miracle and the festival of lights as we illuminate ourselves and all the way doing also illuminate others as well. I wish everybody a beautiful day, a beautiful seventh day of Hanukkah and a beautiful Vizos Hanukkah, remaining remainder time of this festival of lights. Great to see you all. Have a blessed day, a beautiful Shabbos Kodesh, a beautiful Shabbos Parshas Miketz. Lots of love to you all. Stay healthy, stay happy, stay well. And the Mirza Shem, we look forward to seeing everybody very, very soon. Have a blessed day.